we're focusing on the sternoclavicular joint. This is sometimes considered a Cinderella of joints, and this is partly due to its central position and its retrosternal structures. Previously, it's been difficult to, to image with conventional imaging, and there's been a reluctance or a high threshold for treatment, and there's also been a previous, previous paucity of knowledge and research. This is an example. This is a picture of the anatomy of the sternoclavicular joint from an anatomy textbook. It's a synovial joint, it's a diarthroidal joint, so it's saddle shaped. And as we saw in the introduction talk, it talk it's a multi-axle joint, so it's got three degrees of motion. However, as surgeons, what we've noticed is the anatomy of this isn't quite what we see in the textbooks. And in fact, a, a publication by Militin et al. in 2014 has shown us the real anatomy. So rather than the end of the sternoclavicular joint mimicking the AC joint, in fact, it's slightly different. So actually only a third of the joint is intraarticular. So the top third of the joint is where the capsule inserts and it's actually where the intraarticular disc originates. So this is quite important with regards to treatment. So it's actually opened up the opportunity of treating a number of sternoclavicular joint problems with intraarticular arthroscopy, which means that we can now treat SCJ osteoarthritis and SCHA disc, disc tears with day case surgery rather than massive open operations. So the common SCJ pathology is osteoarthritis, as I mentioned, disc tears and instability. At the start, I'll go through the imaging of the sternoclavicular joint. This is an x-ray which is known as a serendipity view, and the reason it's called it that is it's serendipitous if it actually shows any pathology. So a plain x-ray of the sternoclavicular joint really isn't of much use, and that's mainly because the cervical spine sits behind it. So plain x-rays are of no use whatsoever. The most useful investigation probably is a CT scan, and that's good at looking at osteoarthritis. It's also looking good at looking at dislocated joints. So if the joint's actually dislocated, it's not so good at looking at a joint that has previously been dislocated and has been relocated because it is a bony study, so it doesn't look at the soft tissues. A CT arteriogram really is an essential investigation for any acute posterior dislocation and that lets us know what's happening to those important retrosternal vascular studies. In fact, they're rarely damaged, often there's compression, but it's a very important investigation. Disc pathology and instability around the sternoclavicular joint are to do with the soft tissue. So actually MRI scans and MI arthrograms are really what we're moving towards. So this is an arthrogram which can shows a anterior uh, capsular injury. So this is from an anterior dislocation. And this is a scan that shows a disc tear. So as I mentioned in the introductory talk, SCJ osteoarthritis is that in fact very common. Previously, it wasn't really known about. We did a study in 27 where we looked at CT scans and we found there was an in increasing incidence of OA with increasing age. So by about the age of 50, over 60% of people have got SCJ osteoarthritis. However, interestingly, under the age of 35, we found no patients had osteoarthritis. So it is present from about 35 onwards. So for older, uh, or not necessarily older, but for uh, slightly more mature uh, athletes, so recreational uh, tennis and racket sports players in their 40s and 50s upwards do start to present with SCJ osteoarthritis. The type of symptoms that they present with are activity related pain. As I said, it tends to be this slightly older overhead racket sportsman. They often notice a hard lump, which is really an osteophyte of the medial end of the clavicle. And most people say it's a sudden appearance, whereas in fact it's actually slowly been appearing over time. It's only suddenly that they've noticed it. On examination, there's pain on direct palpation. There may or may not be an effusion. They tend to get pain on protraction and retraction of the scapula and also on internal and external rotation. And often there's an element of crepitus. The most commonly used imaging for an SCJ pathology is a CT scan. In my unit, we use digital tomographies. This is where you can use a standard digital X-ray machine that's got an auto positioning ability. And actually, it's able to do a number of uh, images uh, immediately. So we tend to do about 40 images from 45 degrees above to below the horizontal. 
And so you can end up um, with uh, something like this on auto positioning. So this is sufficient to diagnose osteoarthritis on its own. It's not really sufficient to do any other pathologies, but we find it quite useful so we can look at our post-optive patients with uh, exposing them to less radiation. So the management of SCJ osteoarthritis, the vast majority of people with a combination of activity modification and non-steroidal their symptoms will settle down. Sometimes some physiotherapy, particularly helping with scapulothoracic, fu scapulothoracic function is useful. Um, I, I like to use an ultrasound guided cortisone injection for patients that have got continued problems. This is partly as a diagnostic and partly as a therapeutic procedure. And many people, and in many people, this actually settles uh, their symptoms down. However, there's a small group of people that will get an initial response to their cortisone injection, but this tends to die off. And if this is the case, these patients are, are, are suitable for surgery. So previously, surgery of the sternoclavicular joint was done as an open procedure, and it was really analogous to an AC joint. So pay, people just removed uh, about a centimetre of the uh, of the medial end of the clavicle. However, the sternoclavicular joint and the AC joint are very difficult, different, and we'll see later on that the unique thing about the AC joint is the trapezoid ligament keeps it in position. So if you move a centimetre of the clavicle, that gap doesn't collapse down. However, that doesn't occur at the medial end. So if you remove a centimeter of the sternoclavicular joint, what happens is it just collapses down. So you don't really get any effect. And this is done as an open procedure. However, as I showed you earlier, the actual articular part of the medial end of the clavicle is just the lower two thirds. So it's possible to actually remove this as an intra-articular operation arthroscopically. So this is something that we can now do as a day case procedure. And uh, this is the before and after tomogram. So on the right, you can see the uh, arthritic lower two thirds of the joint. So on the left, you can see arthritic two thirds of the joint. And on the right, you can see where that bit's been removed. Uh, we've recently published a series of 50 patients who had uh, SCJ arthritis that was refractory to non-optive measures um, and uh, 44 of them were happy uh, after their uh, surgery. Only 45 were available for follow-up. The other interesting thing that we found is intra-articular disc tears. So this is something that previously had been underappreciated. Uh, it occurs due to shearing injury to the disc. It tends to occur acutely, mainly in younger patients, uh, particularly when doing backhand or forehand tennis shots. They tend to have a, a, a sudden pain. In chronic patients, you can have a degenerative disc tear, and so they can have predominantly a, a, a clicking, a clicking sensation. Clinically, it's diagnosed by a, a clicking and pain on protraction and retraction. Patients almost have a bit of a pseudo subluxation. So as the medial end of the clavicle is clicking over the torn disc, it appears to jump. So some people think that the joint's almost dislocating. Diagnosis is with an MRI scan with uh, a dye in, so MR arthroscopy, and you can get a deem and a wavy appearance to the disc. Once again, the management is activity modification and anti-inflammatory and physiotherapy initially. Most people don't respond to that. However, quite a lot of people do respond to a, a, a therapeutic stroke diagnostic cortisone injection. However, once again, there's a small group of people uh, that don't respond to that and they undergo surgery. And we've recently published a series of 14 patients, 10 of whom were young who had an acute disc tear uh, that all did well following arthroscopic surgery. Sternoclavicular joint instability seems to cast an equal amount of confusion and concern with uh, many physicians. A sternoclavicular joint is stabilised by static stabilisers and dynamic stabilisers. So the static stabilisers are initially the bones, so the medial end of the clavicle and the sternal uh, or the clavicular notch on the sternum. The intrinsic stabilizers are the uh, disc and the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular joint ligaments. And the extrinsic stabilizers are the rhomboid and coracoclavicular ligaments and the intraclavicular ligaments. There's some very important dynamic stabilizers to the sternoclavicular joint, and the main ones are the sternocleidomastoid and the sternal part of pec major, but also subclavius. So previously, sternoclavicular joint instability has been divided into traumatic and atraumatic causes. 
However, more recently, like the glenohumeral humeral joint, we've got a better understanding. And actually, rather than traumatic and atraumatic, we talk about traumatic structural, atraumatic structural and muscle patterning, so non-structural. So starting with traumatic SCJ dislocations, these are very rare and account for less than 2% of upper limb in injuries. They tend to be a, have a very high mechanism of injury and tend to be related to contact sports and road traffic accidents, motorcycling, falling off horses and the such. The mechanism of injury for an anterior dislocation is always indirect, so it tends to be a blow over the anterior lateral aspect of the shoulder, which then levers the clavicle out and dislocates the medial end of the clavicle anteriorly. Most posterior dislocations are indirect again, so this is a blow on the posterior lateral aspect of the shoulder, so example in a ruck or a scrum, and once again this pushes the clavicle posterior and levers, levers the medial end posteriorly, but it can occasionally occur from a, a direct force onto the front of the clavicle, however this is often associated with a fracture. Dislocations can be classified by direction, so anterior or posterior, their severity, so grade 1 a mild sprain, grade 2 a moderate sprain and grade 3 a dislocation, or their status, so they could be acute, recurrent or unreduced. So the management of an acute anterior dislocation, certainly within 48 hours, is a closed reduction. This is something that's best done in an operating theatre and traditionally the patient has a sandbag between uh, just beneath their shoulder longitudinal traction is placed on the arm and then uh, someone else will actually just push the clavicle down to try and reduce it so traditionally the management of an acute anterior dislocation whether it's spontaneously reduced before the patient has come into the ED whether it's been reduced or people have been unsuccessful at reducing it, so irreducible, has just been to rehab. So even irreducible um, anterior dislocations previously have been left and it's felt that patients will cope well with rehab. However, there's a 75% recurrence rate of re-dislocation if you uh, dislocate your shoulder, at, uh, if you dislocate your SCJ anteriorly. So I'd certainly consider referral for surgical assessment. The interesting thing about an acute anterior dislocation is the capture tissues are still present. Um, when pump, someone has a recurrent dislocation, they tend to disappear. So when you have recurrent instability of the glenohumeral joint, often the glenohumeral ligaments are still present, so you can undertake a soft tissue uh, stabilization. However, with an SCJ dislocation, if you have recurrent instability, you always have to do a reconstruction with hamstring tendons, which is a much bigger operation. So we've recently described a technique for the management of acute anterior dislocations where we've repaired the capsule and we've augmented that with an internal brace device. And we had a successful series of 10 cases. An acute posterior dislocation is a uh, in some ways a much more serious injury. I say it's absolutely essential not to just to do a CT scan but to do a CT arteriogram to look for any associated vascular injuries. In fact these are very rare but it's important to, uh, to do this scan just to assess exactly what's going on and particularly when referring a uh, posterior dislocation to any uh, unit such as ours we'd always ask for a CT arteriogram rather than just a straightforward CT scan. Previously, people have advocated a closed reduction. However, there's over a 65% re-dislocation rate with a closed reduction, often within a, within a few days. This is certainly not a life-threatening uh, condition, so previously people have felt it's important that you try to get on and relocate these posterior dislocations immediately. Actually, there's probably a 14-day window to get this reduced, so I'd certainly recommend referring this to a specialist centre and uh, to uh, reduce uh, a posterior dislocation. Uh, you do actually need to do a reconstruction. You can't just repair the posterior capsule tissue. So this is where we would normally consider doing a horizontal figure of eight hamstring tendon reconstruction. These are particularly rare. We're a specialist centre. I've just published a series of uh, 20 posterior, uh, acute posterior dislocations that we fixed up within uh, 14 days, but it took me 11 years to, to, to collect these, so it's really probably less than two a year.
So occasionally I do see patients with a persistent posterior dislocation and this nicely demonstrates what we saw in the introduction talk with regards to scapulothoracic dysfunction. So this is an 18 year old chap who had a posterior dislocation four weeks previously. They'd attempted to reduce it at his local hospital but had had no success and just left it as it was. So he came up to see me and interestingly he wasn't complaining about any issues anteriorly. His main complaint was that his shoulder blade was sticking out and he was having pain and discomfort. And so if we draw some lines here you can see his left shoulder blade is much higher than the right hand side. So What's happened with his uh, posterior dislocation is as the medial end of the clavicle has disappeared posteriorly, it's meant that he's effectively protracted his uh, whole shoulder girdle. So that's actually brought uh, his, his scapula forward. So we undertook a, a stabilization. So this is him post uh, reduction and fixation. You can see he's now symmetrical from the front and more importantly to him, his scapula at the same at the same height. So type 3 muscle patterning SCJ problems are probably the most common that we see. They tend to occur in teenagers and younger patients. Uh, they tend to give a history of this uh, spontaneously occurring. Sometimes it's related to injury, and literally it can just happen overnight. It's often relatively painless and it's not specifically related to generalized laxity or Ehlers-Danlos. So this is an example, this is a 15 year old chap, he is an academy tennis player and he noticed a sudden anterior dislocation of his right sternoclavicular joint with minimal trauma and now it dislocates every time with, with, with any overhead shot and this is just a little video of what happens and you can see I've put an arrow where so every time he uh, retracts or externally rotates his arm his uh, sternoclavicular joint dislocates. Now interestingly we can see what's happening is he's got a muscle patterning problem so he's got over activity of the particularly the sternal part of uh, pec major and sternocleidomastoid is trying to work hard against this and so if we look at this video again what we can see just as his arms come in you can so I just put an arrow it's going to come in so we can see that sternocleidomastoid is really working hard and then as he's bringing his arm forward you can see that the pec major is actually forcibly pulling the medial end of his, his, his clavicle out so the treatment for this is uh, generally specialised physiotherapy. Very occasionally we have to depower pec major with Botox and, and very occasionally we uh, undertake surgery. So the rationale with the physiotherapy is really a, a distraction therapy for uh, pec major. So if you get the patient to uh, pull their arm back and then you try to get them to drag their arm forward but pulling against them so uh, pec major is engaged and rather than getting um, their arm to rotate you get them to rotate in so the arm stays still and the body rotates round so this is my physio foot fill uh, pulling back on this chap's arm then we'll actually get him to turn so that's the same as uh, bringing his arm forward uh, and in doing so you can distract pec major and so this is just a little video so you can see he's pulling hard against the resistance band and then he's rotating out and then you'll see as he rotates back in if you look at the media end of his clavicle it stays in joint so we've depowered uh, pec major so this is a, a fairly long and protracted rehab program you have to tell these patients it often takes about six months but the vast majority of people will do well following this if you would like to know more about the sternoclavicular joint or any other shoulder conditions, visit my YouTube channel Cambridge Shoulder or my website cambridgeshoulder.co.uk.